This, uh, this next gentleman needs uh, no introduction, but uh, we're going to ask you to look at the screen and watch Bob Eubanks, everybody. Hello everybody, I'm Bob Eubanks. <laughs> the reason I wanted to show you that is because I only have 15 minutes and uh, it would take me a half hour to talk about all of the things that I've done and everything. But there's a reason. And I learned very early in life that what you have to do to be successful, at least in my business, is to keep reinventing yourself, to take your strengths and apply them in other areas. I started my career at a 250-watt radio station in Oxnard, California. 200 watts went into the ocean and 50 watts went to the cemetery next door. I was talking to myself. And as fate would have it, my next job was at the big rock and roll station in Los Angeles, KRLA. And I was there with the big guys. I was there with Dick Biondi from Chicago and Casey Kasem out of Detroit and Wink Martindale from Memphis. And this little twerp Bob Eubanks from Oxnard, California. So I knew I'd better make myself important because sometimes you're judged by the people you run with too. And uh, there was a nightclub in New York called the Peppermint Lounge. And they had a band, uh, Joey D and the Starlighters. Joe Pesci, by the way, was their lead guitar player. But they had a hit record uh, called the Peppermint Twist. And it was big and popular. I'm saying, wait a minute, I can do that. I can do that. So we started a nightclub in Southern California for, for people 18 to 25, no booze, and uh, called the Cinnamon Cinders. Peppermint, cinnamon, you see what I mean? And a friend of mine wrote a, a tune called C.C. Cinnamon Cinder. It became the number 23 record in the nation. And after that went off, Elvis released Return to Cinder, and they thought he was saying Cinder, and damn, if they didn't do it, they returned. <laughs> But anyway, because I was buying talent. Every Wednesday night was talent night. And I'd have Stevie Wonder and Chuck Berry and the Beach Boys and Ike and Tina Turner. So I became a talent buyer, too. So on February the 9th, 1964, the Beatles did the Ed Sullivan Show. And 70 million people watched. And then they announced they were going to tour America. And the only other concert promoter in L.A. was a guy by the name of Lou Robin. He turned them down because they wanted $25,000. And he was used to buying Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald for 10. So guess who got the Beatles? So I was able to sign the Beatles, and I produced their concerts in Southern California for the next three years. And, and I stayed in the concert business because they were so successful on their trip all of the English acts started coming over. So I produced the Rolling Stones for two years and Herman and the Hermits and all of the English acts. But then in 1969, the whole drug culture San Francisco thing came about and I got out. In 72, I went back in. And because of my experience in rock and roll, I was able to apply it to country music. So I signed Merle Haggard to a 10-year exclusive contract and because I learned how to do the concerts, then I was able to do management. And I managed Dolly Parton for two years and Barbara Mandrell. So my point here is I was able to take a guy with a minimum amount of talent. I was able to take and keep reinventing and keep reinventing and keep reinventing. And that's what I've done. Now, in 1966, there were two guys by the name of Nicholson and Muir who went out to lunch one day. And uh, they wrote on a napkin, husbands predict wives, wives predict husbands. They gave that to Chuck Barris, who had the dating game on the air at the time. And he developed, he developed the newlywed game. So they proceeded to audition every disc jockey in town. Now today they would audition weathermen. Say Jack was a weatherman, David Letterman was a weatherman. But back then, nope, they auditioned disc jockeys. And I was lucky enough, God only knows why, to win that audition. So we had to show it to the network guys. The big guys from New York flew out there, and they're in a, in a room kind of like this. And, 
We had four couples on the stage. And this is 1966, so TV was pretty quiet. But couple number one was an unknown comedian named Dom DeLuise and his wife, Carol. But I'm going to tell you a story, and I swear to God this is true. Cute little blonde lady down at the end. I said, what's your favorite nickname for your husband? And she said, numb nuts. <laughs> and the ABC boys got up and went upstairs and bought the newlywed game without a pilot, just like that. <laughs> but <laughs> now the first day we went on the air, I'll never forget. Now I'm still a disc jockey, by the way. First day I went on the air or the first day we had to shoot the show, I'm standing in the dressing room and I say, please, God, you got to help me out. I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't help me. Knock on the door. Open the door and here stands two guys in suits. And I immediately think, aha, ABC execs here to say, good luck, Bob. And the guy said, Bob? I said, yeah. He says, you're here by order to appear before the United States Government Anti-Payola Committee on September 16, 1966, and you damn sure better be there. I was served a felony subpoena 30 seconds before I went out to do my first newlywed game. Was I scared? Oh, God, was I scared. But the first day we went on the air, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara gave a speech. NBC covered the speech. CBS, ABC played newlywed game. And we had Super Bowl ratings. So I had a hit television show, and I didn't know how to do it. But what I learned over the next few months, and thank God they let me learn, is something that I've been able to use in my business life and also in my personal life. Here's what I found out. When I first started, I would walk into the dressing room and there would be four couples sitting there ready to bare their soul for a toaster, you know. And I'd say, okay, you guys, we're going to go out there and have some fun. I had nothing. Then I figured it out. If I would sit down and talk to each couple before the show, and ask them questions about their life, about their family, things were different. You see, people don't want to know about you. They want you to know about them. That's the important thing. And I will tell you, it worked for me so well. And first impressions have also worked for me. I found out that the first 20 seconds you meet somebody has a great deal to do with your relationship with them in the future. And I think that's fascinating. I'll tell you what I do sometimes. When I walk into a meeting, before the meeting starts, I immediately look and see what kind of pictures the person has, what's on his desk and all of that. And before I start the meeting, I'll say, is that your son? Tell me about him. Or how long has she been riding that horse? And to, the mo I ask questions about them. And the meeting goes very, very well. There was a lady by the name of Dr. Joellen Demetrius that did something many years ago I find very fascinating. They went to New York, and they put a quarter in a phone booth, and they had 100 people walk in and out. And then when they come out, they say, excuse me, did you find the quarter in the phone booth? 80% of the people lied, even though they knew they had the quarter in their pocket. The next day, the next day, did the same thing. Only this time, when they came out, they said they would shake hands with them, and only 18% of the people lied. So if you can get a personal contact, be careful with that, a personal contact, though, with the people you're dealing with, you will get a much more honest relationship. I find it works every time. So when you walk into an office, find something about that person that you can talk about, and uh, it, it just works sensationally. That's all I can tell you. First impressions, they're very very important, but they're also controllable. The other thing I learned that you have to be careful about laughing at people. There's no room for mean-spirited humor. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip. Uh, her name is Kathy. I met her in 1969, and had I laughed at her, she probably would have given me nothing. But because I laughed with her, she gave me one of those classic moments in television. I said to her, I said, Kathy, is your husband urban or is he rural? And she had no idea what I was talking about, but watch how she answers that question. <laughs> there you go. Basically more urban or rural? I don't know what they mean. <laughs> well, you know it. Uh, I mean, you married him. What do you think? Uh, uh, heck, he's urban. He's urban. Yeah. How long has he been that way? 
Isn't she wonderful? See, had I laughed at her, she would have said nothing. Before the show, her husband said, the first time I met my wife, I wanted to make love to her in the worst way. She said, you did make love to me in the worst way. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to talk to you about, the elderly. By the year 2025, there will be twice as many people over the age of 50 as there are today. So look out for us old folks, because by 1925, we're going to control 80%, 2025, we're going to control 80% of the spendable income. And old people are funny. I heard a story the other day about a 95-year-old man whose friends got him a really hot date. And she came in and she says, I'm here to give you super romance. He said, I'll take the soup, you know. But <laughs> anyway, I used to have elderly couples on the show. Their humor is different. Criticism, and I believe, is a disease. And for some reason, some of us feel that we have the right to criticize people. We don't. Uh, my minister told me a great line, and it is, you don't have to blow out my candle to make yours brighter. And I think that's true, because all criticism is, it's just a dishonest way of patting yourself on the back. That's all it is. It will ruin a relationship at home. It will ruin a relationship at work. So be careful of criticism. So what I talk about when I have my AV guy with me, what I talk about <laughs> in my keynote, uh, I talk about all of those things. It's a very funny keynote, but I believe it has a really, really strong message. And it works from the, from the boiler room to the boardroom. So just please keep that in mind. I do three different kinds of shows. I do a half hour I do an hour keynote, then I do a half hour keynote, and if you have a spousal event, I do a half hour keynote, and then we play a not so newlywed game with the couples that are there. It's funny, it works, and I discovered that I am the only person to have produced a Beatle concert all three years they toured America. So I put together a show called Backstage with the Beatles, and I tell, I have a Beatle band on stage with me, and I tell stories that lead up to their music. Uh, for instance, in 69, when the Beatles broke up, Paul McCartney was really upset. And he had a dream one night. His mother was in the dream. And she said, don't worry about it, Paul. Just, just let it be. Bam, music. See, so I've got a whole hour and a half show like that. I'm very, very fortunate. And I want to tell you something, that right after lunch, you're going to meet a guy by the name of Dan Metcalf. And uh, Dan's a business partner of mine, but he's an amazing guy. He knows how to put teams together. In fact, Dan has coached 26 professional soccer players that are out there right now. He's a team builder, and uh, he's a very, very interesting fellow with a great background. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bob Eubanks, everybody.